kids can make their way to Children's Church. The rest of us are going to turn to Luke 6. Kids can take off and enjoy that. We're into a new series this morning. It is a series that's going to get us through the summer, but it's a little hit and miss. So if you miss one, you could always go online and check it out. And there's advantage to that because you could fast forward right? You're like, oh, he's getting into the blah, blah, blah. Just fast forward me, and you could hit to the good parts if you happen to find any. But even like today, so many on vacation, hit and miss throughout the summer is okay, because what we're going to do is 11 weeks, we're going to look at the apostles, the 12 apostles. We're going to spend some time and look at each of them for this reason. We'd like to take a look at what is it, what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus or a Christian? This is what we have, is we have an opinion already formed because we watch TV and we have friends and we go to a church, so based on our limited amount of exposure to what Christian is, we have formed opinions. I don't really so much blame the world that says the Christians are very judgmental. That's usually the first thing they'll say. I get that. Kind of behind the curtain, I see that because they're doing things the Bible says not to do, and we're pointing it out. Well, that's going to make you a little judgmental. So based on their limited exposure to Christian, that's what they're going to see. And we have good and bad as we describe what it means to be an actual follower of Jesus. And so by way of some intro today, we're looking at three very simple traits, and they are that a Jesus follower is ordinary, imperfect, but chosen. I'm using several books in this series. My favorite is by Gene Getz. I'm a little bit of a Gene Getz fan as far as author goes. There are some others. John MacArthur's got a a nice book on the subject. There's other series that we've used. But surfaces off into the top are these three traits. And I don't know if I would have named any of them if I were just simply to say, describe what a follower of Jesus is. But these are not unusual. Take a look at Luke chapter 6. If you have your Bible there, Luke 6, 12. Luke 6, 12. You'll see a listing here. In those days, he went out on the mountain to pray, and in the night, he continued in prayer to God. And when day came, he called his disciples and chose from them twelve, and then he lists them. Okay, look what's happening here. You need to understand, we do, as we're looking into this, some categories. There is a broad category of followers of Jesus that are the disciples, generally disciples. There were many of them. In fact, Luke 10, the only passage that does this, Luke 10 actually refers to Jesus sending out the 70 or the 72. He actually had a crowd of 70 specifically that he sent out in twos to do miraculous things and to preach the gospel. So he had this larger group of 70. Luke was probably one of them because Luke wasn't one of the 12. So you try to figure where did he fit. He was really likely one of the 70. So those are the disciples. But then from the disciples, there are apostles. But you would have to specifically state the 12. That's how they're referred to, the 12. You can't just say apostle because there are other apostles. But then there's the 12. The 12 apostles, we would mostly agree, I think most 
Christian groups today agree that by definition there are not any apostles today. It'd be pretty cool if there were because I could have a long robe. Something with smoke. I would definitely pull the smoke on a stick thing. Because the definition of apostle that most accept is that they were personally called by Jesus. Personally selected and called by Jesus. That's what the apostles were. So we have this original 12, but then there are some beyond that, like the apostle Paul. Right? He's not one of the 12, but he was an apostle. Barnabas is referred to, you know that name from Acts. Barnabas was an apostle, but he wasn't one of the elite 12. That was the important, that was the foundation. These 12 were it. In fact, the 12 were so important that when one of them went astray, Judas, drops their number to 11, in Acts, the whole machine stopped until they reselected a twelfth. And then it kept going again. This twelve was pretty important. And so, for as important as they are, probably haven't looked that much into them. They're, they're listed in four places in the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and exactly, Acts. And I tricked you. See, you just got on a rail there. You're like, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and you're like, well, of course, it's John. John didn't do anything normal. So it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Acts. Uh, list them. And they're all in a particular groups of four. I don't think the groups of four ever change. The first group of four never change. It's Peter, James, Andrew, and John. Those are the four. And they're listed, I think, the same. In fact, you may find a difference. If you look those up, you may find a different name, but it's the same person. Just going by as we look through, find out if it's a different name, like Bartholomew is also Nathaniel. Um, Thaddeus is the other Judas. I'd go by Thaddeus, too. Right? He said, Judas, aren't you the... No, no, I'm not that one. He's gone. I'm Thaddeus. We know some of their occupations, but not many, like four or five of them is all. And that's not very many because three are fishermen. So you, we really don't know. And you could name, what's a, a profession of one of the elite 12? Do you know of one? Tax collector? So tax collector, fisherman, and a zealot. Who said that? Nice. You should be down there teaching the kids. That's smart. I have it because it's written here. And some think that it was actually a position, that it wasn't a just description, he's a zealot. It was actually he's a zealot, like business card-like, a zealot. One thing that's noticed by all of them is... We're not going to call them a motley crew. That's too much. But they're all very, very different. Boy, is that not like a church? They're all very different. The conversations of those 12, I would love to have sat by the fire at night after a long day of being kicked out of a town or some great miracles and Jesus is sitting there eating some fish and they're just chatting. I would love to see the dynamic. I think everybody would be amazed by the dynamic of who was quiet, who dominated, who was funny, who wasn't funny, who was most sensitive. That would be a fascinating look. Well, it's kind of what our series is on. We're looking into the, the personalities of all of them and some traits of them that we maybe could model after ourselves. But ordinary was definitely the case. They weren't the richest in town. That's for sure. They also weren't clean with their reputation. That wasn't true either. 
is Henry Blackaby. How many of you have done that Bible study series, Experiencing God? Isn't that a great one, Mark? I love that. It's been out a while, but it's terrific. One phrase in there that everyone seems to repeat is, anybody in the hands of God can do what God can do. That's descriptive of these 12. Their strength was really in Jesus. It wasn't in their own abilities and their own traits. Edward Kimball is well known today because Edward Kimball was a Sunday school teacher, uh, kind of adult youth. Well, a 17-year-old was in his class, so whatever age crowd that would be, Edward Kimball was the Sunday school teacher. And the 17-year-old, Dwight, was uh, a shoe salesman. In fact, it's very funny. He was a shoe salesman from out of town. This is Boston. He's a shoe salesman at his uncle's shoe store. The uncle said, I'll hire you work in the back room, stocking, and maybe sales. I will hire you, but you have to go to church. <laughs> that hilarious? That's an uncle. A funkle, they call him, right? The, the fun uncle. So that was him, and to me, he's kind of the hero of the story, and I don't even know his name. Yes, I'll hire you, but you have to go to church. He goes to church. In comes Edward Kimball, builds a relationship, drops by the shoe store, which is so contemporary, catch him on their own turf, goes in and leads him to Christ. And not only do we now know who that Dwight guy is, the chain after him is quite remarkable. The shoe salesman is D.L. Moody. It's Dwight Moody. Dwight Moody was instrumental in leading Wilbur Chapman to Christ, who was instrumental, not instrumental, his crusade led Billy Sunday to Christ. Billy Sunday led Mordecai Ham to Christ. And guess who came to know the Lord at a Mordecai Ham evangelistic meeting in Charlotte, North Carolina? Billy Graham. All started back with the uncle, who may even have been called a little bit of a jerk. You're really going to hire him, going to make him go to church? Are you going to pay him to go to church? The uncle would say, yeah, if I had to. The hero is Edward Kimball, isn't it? This ordinary nature if we accepted the ordinariness of ourselves, of where God has planted us, and make a difference where we're planted, and trust God for the big picture, he knows, I'll, I'm sure I'll never lead a D.L. Moody-type character to Christ. I, I just got that bad feeling that's not going to happen. But it's okay because I'm a part of the overall plan that God is working in the purposes of his church in my ordinary way. And it could have a big consequence and maybe, and maybe not. Beyond ordinary, the second point is imperfect. I pulled up some passages <clears throat> that really show not just the disciples, these are the 12, the elite 12, the original apostles, not just what they were like before, but what they were like while walking with Jesus while they were with him. This isn't past life. This is like what it's like today. Matthew 26 was a story where that perfume was being, quote, wasted on Jesus. And the disciples were indignant of the fact that that was being wasted when that could be sold to feed or take care of the needy. Do you remember that? That's funny because Jesus was only grateful for the sacrifice. 
all 12, were like, oh, that is a terrible waste. Think of what we could do for the poor. And Jesus going, well, here we are again. It's me with my view and the 12 of them with the wrong view. There was another case in Matthew 16. They went to the other side of the lake, and they got there. It's kind of a funny passage where they were talking amongst themselves, I forgot to bring bread. And they're like, you didn't. I honestly gave you one responsibility to bring bread, and you forgot it. Well, Jesus, kind of knowing what's going on, he made a remark about the Pharisees and unleavened bread, and he was talking at a deep level about the Pharisees. They thought he was mad at them for not bringing bread. And he's like, you guys can't even follow a conversation. Like, you guys are upset that you didn't bring bread. And they're like, yeah, we should have, and they didn't. He goes, where were you? We just fed 5,000 people with bread and fish. Like, how is that possibly bothering you? Oh, yeah, that's a good point. You could do that again, couldn't you? It's like us. We're going through a challenging time in our life, possibly a health scare or a new stage of life because of a loss, and you're really struggling with finding this, and you don't know, is God, has God ever let you down? As we let time go and you look back, He has been faithful to you. He has been kind and He's been gracious to you. Based on that, you can count on the fact that he will be kind and gracious to you moving forward. Am I right? Amen? Come on, work with me. It's the same thing they did, but we're making fun of them. No, we don't have any bread. Ah, gee. We sh- the last Circle K or 7-Eleven was like 15 miles back. I mean, we can't even get any Little Debbies. We've got nothing. And they literally are upset in missing Jesus' conversation about the Pharisees because they're worried about literally eating. And he finally, he goes, where is your faith? Like, I can't believe we're talking at this level. You're missing everything going on because you're worried about bread. And as I say all that, I'm thinking of myself. You're so worried about this and this, you're missing the big picture of what's going on. He's already said he's taking care of that. You're okay. Your health, it'll be okay. Oh, it means I'm going to get better? I didn't say that. I said you're going to be okay. I don't know what's going to happen. And life is different now. And absolutely, I prefer it being back the way it was. I know. Of course you do. No one blames you for that. But the fact is, it is what it is right now. By the authority of God, he's allowed it, and we can trust him with it. But his elite 12, missing the whole point, Yeah, I just, I just wonder, I wonder in this selection process of the 12, if maybe while he was in prayer one night where he said, hey, God the Father, did I pick the right 12? I know we didn't have last names. You know, they're going by first names. Maybe he picked the wrong Matthew. There's a lot of Jameses. Maybe he picked the wrong James. He never thought that because that's what he wanted. They were imperfect. That's what we are. So when we point that out with each other, what is qualification? To be a member, to be in good standing, what does that mean? Well, according to these 12, the standard's pretty low. They need to be ordinary, because that's what they all were. They were all imperfect. They were imperfect even three years into following him every day. How's that for discipleship? You're following Jesus for three years. You're walking with him. You're eating with him. There is no doubt that each of those 12 have personal examples of walking alone with Jesus, probably for hours just talking. 
Is that awesome? And yet they all denied him. It's unbelievable. And Jesus was fine. He's like, I know what I picked. I'm well aware. It's because of this last one. It's chosen. Ordinary, imperfect, but chosen. Take a look at Ephesians 2. It's a passage we know, and then we'll just kind of read on just a little bit. It'll be the last passage we'll uh, take a look at. Ephesians 2. Yeah, let's, let's start at verse 4. We're kind of in a calm. Communion's produced a nice calm atmosphere. We're relaxed. Let's read a little bit more where it starts up in verse 4. God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we are dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ, for by grace you've been saved. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your doing, it's the gift of God, not a result of works so that nobody would boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. He not only saved you by grace, you didn't earn it, for by grace you're saved. His unearned, undeserved favor upon you is why you're saved. Saved by grace, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. Okay, generally, we're all, no, not just generally, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. He has prepared you to do the good works of which he's prepared you to do. We're chosen. First Peter says we are a chosen priesthood. You've been selected. So out of the 12, it's similar. He didn't pick your family. Many of you, he picked you out of your family because no one else in your family knows the Lord, and you don't even understand that to this day. I'm always fascinated by that. That it's just strangely somebody. Or the opposite. Many in your family know the Lord, but there's one holdout. They are just not interested. They don't even have the same values that you have. It's just there's no connection. And you want to see somebody who's a workmanship of God, who's chosen by God to do good works, and then you see somebody who just doesn't even seem to be on the radar of God. I don't understand any of that. Why some, why others is not the subject. The subject is you in faith in Jesus Christ are chosen. You're special. Oh, wait, ordinary. Oh, yeah, you're definitely ordinary. Flawed. Oh, yeah, we'll prove that every day, right? Spend 15 minutes with any one of us and you'll know we're flawed. But we're chosen. That's what made the difference. So we take the 12 apostles and we put them on this. Aren't they amazing? Look at this. No, let's lower that a little bit. There's no cathedral named after you, possibly. But I'll probably bet that those apostles in heaven are going, oh, don't build another place with my name on it. If they only knew me, 
I bet you that's true, as it's true for a lot of us. I'm not a big movie guy, <clears throat> not for any moral high ground or anything or pious Christian reason. I just don't like to pay the money because I'm cheap, and then I don't like to sit that long in a movie. But there was a time <clears throat> we were as a family, we were in a foreign country, <clears throat> we were in Utah, and <clears throat> uh, Grant and I went and saw a Green Lantern, <clears throat> my kind of movie, uh, brainless, superhero, whatever. And I got to read this to get it right. Uh, the, the whole saving of the world hinged on one character. Flawed for sure. But it's the fact that the Green Lantern chose the person. That was literally what happened. In fact, he quit, didn't want to do it, didn't want to carry that mantle of Green Lantern. He gave up. Everyone around him agreed except for one thing. Like, yeah, you definitely need to quit. You're kind of a loser. Except for the fact the lantern chose him, and the lantern doesn't make mistakes. Is that not an amazing parallel? That's us. I feel like quitting, too. The Christian life, the struggle, the interpersonal relationships and the standards and the, we, we bump into each other and we bump into other groups and all of these struggles are going on. Yeah, I would love to quit too. But there's one thing. <laughs> I'm chosen. I'm not only chosen, but he has prepared for me good works to do. He's prepared them beforehand, good works for you to do. And we see that clearly in, in the 12. It was the time of, <clears throat> it was the time of Constantine, third, fourth century A.D., nobody looked into the apostles till then. Isn't that interesting? Three, four hundred years, nothing written about them, nothing really known about them. And about 300, 400 years later, all of a sudden there was this regained interest. The great church father, Christostrom, actually said, I would love to just know what they ate, how they spent time, how they talked, how they interacted. That's fourth century. And then came then all of the exploring and figuring out, and that's what we're going to do for the next 10 weeks. We're going to take each of these characters, and we're going to look into them and see what can we learn from them. But I'll tell you the biggest thing that we learn right off the bat is that they're ordinary, they're imperfect, but they're chosen. If you aren't certain of your relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ, I don't want you to leave until you know that for sure. Bank that. It's not just coming here and it's not taking communion. It's not giving to the church. It's not being a member. It's not doing good things. It's faith in Jesus Christ. For by grace we're saved through faith. Please know that before we move on. But then the rest of us, you're chosen. And the one next to you is chosen too, so maybe lighten up on them. They're chosen too. They're imperfect. You don't need to point it out. They point it out enough in their own life. They know how imperfect they are. And they're ordinary. Get it. That's okay too. But we're chosen. God has a special task for every one of us in our being chosen. Let's pray. Let's bow in prayer. Once again, in the quietness of this moment, just listen to these words with heads bowed. For by grace you've been saved through faith. It's not of your own doing. It's the gift of God. It's not a result of work so that somebody would boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.